Hello and welcome back to my channel What If Deku Tuo. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off part 10 of our series, What If Deku Unleashed God Like Quirk Surpassing All. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Drip Bayless from FanFiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Overhaul was not having a great day. Eerie had been especially petulant of late, which, under normal circumstances, wouldn't have been a problem that he couldn't solve by merely tearing her apart and putting her back together a few times until she fixed her behavior. However, her escape attempts had become much more frequent as well. That, in and of itself, was an issue. Tracking her down and bringing her back wasn't the problem. She was six. The issue with her ever-increasing bout of rebellion was that she may potentially get it in her head that she was a human being with autonomy and a purpose beyond his own ends. She would begin to hope for a new day. That was unacceptable. He would be sure to stomp whatever fantasies of hope she was dreaming up in much more brutal fashion than what was typical the next time around so that she'd refrain from stepping out of line in the future. He couldn't have the Yakuza's ticket back to prominence and his key to a cleansed world having any measure of self-actualization. That would completely defeat the purpose. Beyond that, there was still the issue of the attack on his trigger operations to consider. There wasn't a lot of information left at the scene to go on, which made investigation tedious, but it wasn't as if they were bereft of any leads. They'd sniff the culprits out in time, and when they did, there would be hell to pay for crossing the shy Hasekai. When there was a knock at the door, Overhaul called them inside, and in walked Overhaul's right hand, Hari Kirono, known to all in the family as Chronostasis. Overhaul, we got a hit on who attacked our operation, came the ice-cold intonation of the man. Overhaul paused everything he was doing and looked directly at his most trusted subordinate. And? There's a man who can turn anything he touches to dust, which would match up with the crumbled state of the warehouse that was attacked, he explained. He does a lot of business with Jurin, so we know how to contact him. Another man who wields blue fire not dissimilar to what was found at the scene also operates with him in a group the League of Villains. Overhaul's eyes narrowed. The group that attacked Yua. The one that just lost the criminal underworld's boogeyman. Precisely, Chronostasis nodded. Set up a meeting, Overhaul ordered, not wasting any time. I want to introduce myself to them by the end of the week. As you wish, the man nodded before exiting the office, shutting the door behind him. A dark chuckle escaped Overhaul's lips under his mask, and he shut his eyes in satisfaction. The League of Villains, this is too perfect. What better way to fill the newfound power vacuum than by wiping out all for one's legacy in one fell swoop? This was going to be a good week. You really don't have to feed me, Mom, Izuku bemoaned before opening his mouth to accept the rice his mother held up to him anyway. Nonsense, she swiftly denied feeding him another bit of rice with her chopsticks. How could you possibly feed yourself with your arms in such a state? They're not broken, Mom, Izuku responded, accepting yet another clump of rice from his mother. The burns aren't even that bad anymore. Inko pointedly ignored him with a warm smile while continuing to feed her son, to which Izuku still didn't raise too much of a fuss over. This kept up as the two entered a comfortable silence, both merely enjoying being in the presence of the other once again. Izuku welcomed any sort of normalcy after his ordeal, and Inko was much the same. Izuku was mid-bite when a knock at the door garnered the mother-son duo's attention. When it opened, a doctor stepped in holding a clipboard with a thick stack of papers attached. Ah, Izuku Midoriya, you're awake, he addressed with a smile before looking to Inko. And Mrs. Midoriya, you're here, too. Excellent. You can just call me in co, she kindly informed, and the doctor nodded. Izuku eyed his mother curiously when she said that, a thought coming to mind that had been floating around for a while, 
but he put a pin in it for the moment. Well, at the rate you're healing, you should be good to go as soon as tomorrow afternoon, the doctor informed them. That isn't the primary reason I'm here, though. While we were treating you, we encountered some peculiarities in your physiology, so we opted to run some scans and observe you. Peculiarities? Inko warily questioned. Peculiarities may have too much of a negative connotation, the doctor mused. How long have you had the slits on your forearms? Neither your medical records nor your quirk records contain anything about them. They're a pretty new development, Izuku confirmed. I believe they're vents to help keep me from overheating as my quirk becomes more powerful. I only noticed them the day before the camp was attacked. How long ago was that? About a week, Inko answered. The doctor hummed. Have you noticed any other abnormalities in regards to your quirk and how it affects your body? Izuku placed his chin in his hand and thought it over, and in finally doing so, a few things jumped out at him. Yes, actually, a little while before the training camp, I passed out from overloading my brain when briefly using my white flames, which hasn't happened in years. Noticing his mother's worried expression in his periphery, he continued. I thought it was just deterioration from disuse, but I used them again pretty soon afterward, and nothing of the sort happened, almost as if it reset itself. He paused when the doctor started jotting down everything he was saying until he motioned for Izuku to continue. Beyond that, I discovered a sort of heightened stage for my quirk. I call it second gear. It's essentially all of the individual components of my quirk working in tandem giving me a significant boost on top of it all. He noticed he had both the doctor and his mother's rapt attention, so he proceeded with his explanation. I first tapped into it during the UA Sports Festival, and it tore my body to shreds. Afterward, I only used it a second time against a villain at the training camp, and I was unbelievably sore in the aftermath, but I wasn't in nearly as bad of shape as I figured I would be. So, those burns weren't a result of this heightened stage? The doctor asked for confirmation. No, they were from, he began to answer, but he hesitated in the presence of his mother. He still hadn't told her about his experiences with the black flames. Something else entirely, he finished. The concern dressing his mother's expression was like a stab in the heart, but he still wasn't ready to bring it up to her. Thankfully, the doctor didn't push the subject. Well, I think we've found an answer to that mystery, the doctor stated matter-of-factly, drawing the mother-son duo's curiosity. We found several physiological anomalies when examining you that could only partially be explained away by your quirk. For instance, your musculature is substantially more dense than the average person with a strength enhancer quirk, which is already about twice as dense on average. The same applies to your bones as well. Overall, you're a lot sturdier than you already were, according to your records. Izuku silently combed through all of the information he was given. It all made sense in regards to his lack of injuries after tapping into second gear, but it didn't quite connect to why he still felt any amount of strain when using his flames in isolation. Maybe the hypothesis he and Miss Joke came up with was accurate in that the flames he could access were somehow imperfect usages of his true quirk, and second gear was how his quirk was truly intended to be used. Maybe it just took time after initially manifesting to truly develop, and his body needed time, wear, and tear to catch up. There were so many new questions and possibilities to explore given this new information. Inko, meanwhile, was rather taken aback by the news, not sure how to feel about her son undergoing a pseudo-transformation. Did you come across anything else? The doctor nodded, a bit more excitement bleeding into his demeanor. We also discovered that alongside your musculoskeletal system, both your heart and brain have undergone some changes as well. That snapped Izuku out of his internal mutter storm completely and earned his undivided attention. In what regard? They grew, the doctor answered simply, and at the alarmed expressions of the mother and teen, he quickly amended his statement. Only by a marginal amount in all practicality, but they did also become more dense, as well, comparatively to your muscles and bones. 
If you say that your quirk overloaded your brain much faster than it ordinarily would that time, then it's very likely that your body was already undergoing the redevelopment process, so it was out of whack, so to speak. That all but confirmed Izuku's burgeoning suspicions about his quirk and body's rapid development, and he couldn't help the mixture of joy and wonderment that came over him. This was becoming a gold mine for him to analyze and experiment with that he hadn't experienced since his quirk manifested in the first place. His mother, however, was still much more subdued. Her concerns were not entirely assuaged by the revelations. What does this mean for Izuku? The doctor nodded as if to assure Inko that he understood her concern. Emitter and transformation quirks do often come with supplementary mutations that make wielding the quirk easier and less dangerous to the user, such as your son's natural resistance to fire in most instances. Mr. Midoriya already had a few mutations of this variety, but they've been supercharged. That doesn't even include the newly appearing mutations on your arms in the form of the vents. Something like this is absolutely unprecedented. He turned and looked Izuku right in the eye as he spoke his next words. In plain terms, your body has quite literally evolved to better handle your quirk's upper limits. You are both a medical and scientific anomaly, Izuku Midoriya. Izuku and Inko were rendered speechless at the revelation. They knew that his quirk was bullshit at the best of times, but this was becoming beyond reason. His body was literally infringing on pre-established scientific principles. Then again, quirks in general did that in spades, leading to the birth of quirk science as a wholly separate field of study in the first place. Rules were just different when quirks were involved, and everything they thought they already knew about the world was always being called into question. The doctor cleared his throat to break the contemplative silence. If you'd be willing, we'd like to run some tests and a few more scans on your body, as well as check for any further abnormalities in your quirk factor. We're breaching into uncharted territory with this. Inko wanted to decline there and then, refusing to allow her son to become a test subject for medical experimentation. However, she caught her son's eye, and the look he was giving her gave her pause. His eyes told her that they were largely on the same page, but his boundless curiosity wasn't going to allow him to completely deny the opportunity for scientific advancement. The two engaged in a silent conversation while the doctor patiently waited at his bedside, and when the two seemed to come to a wordless accord, they turned to face him. I'd rather not be turned into a guinea pig, if possible, Izuku dryly spoke, and the doctor nodded with a chuckle. I'll submit to the tests so long as they're non-invasive and my mother is present. The tests shouldn't be invasive beyond obtaining blood and DNA samples for observation, the doctor assured. We'll maintain strict confidentiality unless you otherwise request, as well, so you don't have to worry about that. Inko wasn't quite sure if she totally believed that, though that was likely due to her natural paranoia rather than through any fault of the doctor himself. Even still, there were certainly ways to make her son's records disappear if need be. It just took one conversation with Nezu, which was going to happen later that day. All right, we'll go along with this, Inko conceded with a sigh. Excellent, the doctor replied with a smile. We'll have you both sign a few documents, and then we can get started tomorrow morning. It shouldn't last long at all. You'll most likely be good to go before noon. The two nodded, and once finished with any other tasks, the doctor left the duo to their own devices. Inko sighed once again, and she gave her boy a tired smile before reaching for the bowl of rice to continue feeding him. Izuku grumbled in protest of being fed while putting up no actual fight against the feeding whatsoever. That was, at least, until a mental note he made when the doctor entered came back to him. Hey, mom, Izuku spoke up gaining his mother's attention. How come you never changed your name? She regarded him curiously before putting the bowl of rice down. What do you mean? After what happened the day I awakened my quirk, he trailed off, and his mother quickly put the pieces together. Why did you keep his name, I mean? She gave him a warm smile and softly ran her hand through his hair. Because it's not just his, it's yours, too. 
You know I'd change it along with you if you ever decided to, Izuku stated, leaning into his mother's ministrations. It's not like I place a ton of value on it. I know, she nodded. Honestly, it's just simpler. Akatani, Shimura, Midoriya. At the end of the day, everyone from those lines is dead. She paused, and then her expression momentarily darkened. Almost everyone. Izuku's eyes widened at the utterance. Did she know about Tamira Shigaraki? When had she learned? Questions for later. Regardless, the one person doing the Midoriya name proud is you, Izuku, she continued, the warmth of her smile returning. Hisashi doesn't define the Midoriya name. He isn't the be-all and end-all to whatever legacy the name has. That designation belongs squarely to you, so long as you desire it. It's your legacy to establish and yours alone, and I think you've been doing a fantastic job of it already. Izuku's cheeks reddened, and he unconsciously began to heat up, eliciting a giggle from his mother. He was saved when a second knock at the door came along, and in hurried a familiar head of blonde hair framing round glasses. The blue eyes stationed behind those glasses were swimming in a mixture of relief and concern. Melissa, Izuku questioned with surprise written across his face in permanent marker. Izuku, I'm so glad that you're okay, Melissa exhaled once she finally took the sight of him in. I was really worried when Uncle Might said you were in trouble. I've never seen him so intense before. Izuku swore she had a bit of a faraway look in her eyes for a brief moment before she shook it off and continued fretting. It was then that Izuku noticed her arms were bandaged up all the way to her fingertips in a similar manner to his own. Anyway, you're safe now, and that's what matters, she finished before finally noticing the other person in the room. Inko was making no attempt to hide her smirk, and then she put her hands up in mock surrender. Oh, no, don't mind me, you two continue. Izuku cursed not being born with invisibility as his quirk, as he knew his mother was taking great joy in turning him into a beat. To his horror, however, Melissa was unfazed. Oh, don't worry about that, he's not my type, Melissa assured with a smile. He's a little short. Izuku squawked in indignation while Inko nearly cackled. Duly noted. Melissa and his mother were getting on way too well. He needed to put a stop to it before they ganged up on him and he accidentally set the bed ablaze. Putting aside the fact that you're only three centimeters taller, Izuku grumbled before turning to his mother, this is Melissa Shield. We met at the I-Expo. Melissa, this is my mom. It's lovely to meet you, Shield, Inko warmly greeted. Please, just call me Melissa she insisted with a smile of her own. And likewise. Whatever she was planning on saying died on her tongue when something finally clicked upon looking at Inko for long enough. Wait, you're the woman who fought alongside Uncle Might? Inko was taken aback by the designation. Excuse me? Yeah, just about every news channel was broadcasting the whole thing, Melissa excitedly continued, drawing Izuku's interest as well. The cameras caught it all. Everyone's talking about you. Blankness was all Melissa received in return, and Izuku's interest was piqued. Inko, meanwhile, opened her mouth, but no words came out, and she closed it again. This repeated a few more times before she finally uttered anything. Come again? Here, it'll be easier to just show you, Melissa said before pulling out her phone and surfing the web for some articles to show the dumbstruck woman. Izuku opted to join her in the search with his own phone, and he was astounded to find that she was telling the truth. Staring him in the face was a picture of his mother looking down at all for one with absolute death in her gaze, the silhouettes of All Might and Gran Torino looming behind her. He had to admit that she looked pretty damn imposing with her hair billowing in the breeze among the desolation of the battlefield. It was a fantastic shot, however the hell they got it. Izuku looked to his mother, and he couldn't hold back the shocked guffaw that escaped him at the sight he encountered. Inko was staring wide-eyed at a similar picture of herself with the headline, Behind Every Great Man, that wasn't the end of it, either. Article upon article was written about the Camino incident, 
many focusing on All Might's triumphant victory, of course, but many others focused on the underground pro that came out of retirement to rescue her son. In fact, Shueisha Publishing's article was literally titled, Underground Pro Comes Out of Retirement to Rescue Her Son. For the first time in his life, Izuku had seen his mother at a loss for words. The woman with a tongue as quick as lightning and wit sharp enough to slice through steel was rendered a despondent ghost by sudden fame. Guess you're famous, Mom, Izuku joked when he regained his wits. I'm, Inko mumbled as she continued to blue screen. Um, is she okay? Melissa cautiously asked Izuku with a touch of concern in her voice. Izuku quickly nodded to assure her that everything was fine. Yeah, she's fine, she's just not used to having a whole lot of attention and she fainted, okay? Well, let's get her up on the bed. Izuku and Melissa scramble over to the blissfully unconscious woman and hoisted her out of her chair and onto the hospital bed, Izuku not even trying to hide his snickering all the while. There was no way in hell that he was ever going to let her live this down. Once she was comfortably on the bed, Izuku turned to Melissa. So, what are you doing all the way in Japan? Not that I'm not happy to see you or anything. It's just that I didn't think you could leave I Island. Melissa's face fell, and Izuku knew immediately that he touched a sore subject, likely the sore subject. You don't have to answer that if you don't. No, no, it's fine, Melissa assured. It would have to come out eventually. The situation on I Island is messy. There was a lot of unpleasant fallout from the incident, and alongside my dad's reputation being irreparably destroyed, a ton of suspicion and general mistrust was cast in all directions. Uncle Mike tried his best to shield me from it, but I could tell that everyone in the scientific community was going to be side-eyeing me for the foreseeable future, at least on the island. It was just better for everyone if I was out of the picture. A lengthy sigh escaped her lips, and her voice began to tremble. After Mom died, Papa was all I had. He was everything to me. After all this, after what he did, and that bastard with the red hair. She started to choke up, and Izuku immediately moved to help comfort her. But he stopped in his tracks when she put her hand up and took a moment to compose herself pushing her thumb and index finger under her glasses to wipe away the tears that escaped her efforts. She took another deep breathe and regained her composure. She looked back at Izuku, and the redness surrounding the blue of her irises made his heart clench. So, yeah, I opted to leave, and since I didn't have any classified information to take with me, they allowed it, Melissa continued with a morose blankness. Then, she hesitated. But after a lengthy moment of internal deliberation, she pressed on. I, I received an offer, and I took it. I'm transferring to UA to finish out my last year. An offer? Izuku questioned with a furrowed brow. One I couldn't refuse, she nodded with a stern expression. So, I'm here now. All might, you didn't. Izuku's darkening thoughts were halted when he was wrapped in a warm embrace by the taller girl. Thank you again for being there for me, Izuku, Melissa said, her voice wavering once again. Izuku was taken off guard for a brief moment, then he returned the hug. Yeah, of course. I'm sure that May will be ecstatic to see you, too. That brought a smile back to her face. The hug continued until the two heard a groan come from the bed, and the two friends separated in time to see Inko come to... You all right, Mom? Izuku held back his laughter just long enough to ask. Oh, Izuku, there you are, Inko managed while sitting up on the bed and gaining her bearings. I had the strangest dream just now. The news captured the battle with all for one, and I had apparently come out of it with a deeply unsettling level of popularity. Right, a dream, Izuku replied amidst escaping snorts, confusing his mother. Whatever she was going to say was halted when her phone started vibrating, and she checked the caller ID to find that it was Mitsuki calling her, so she answered. Mits. Inkai, you're a fucking sensation. Mitsuki was loud enough to be heard by the other two occupants of the room, and, combined with the pale-faced horror dawning on his mother, Izuku completely lost it. 
The first thing Mind have felt when he came to the next day was a soreness in his chest. Then the blinding light of the fluorescent fixtures overhead bombarded his vision before he could properly readjust. Such were the unfortunate consequences of being almost comatose, he lamented. When his eyes finally adjusted to the immersion into the real world from perpetual darkness, the first thing he noticed was a yellow sleeping bag nestled in the corner. It was vaguely familiar, but he put it out of his mind and looked to his bedside table and the... What the hell? Were those cards? He gingerly reached over to the table and picked up the closest card he could reach, and upon opening it, he found a picture of Kaminari standing above him with a sharpie and a mischievous grin. Blinking, he looked over at the mirror, and he deadpanned when he saw the manhood drawn on his forehead in sharpie. Behind the picture was a message from the sparky blonde wishing him a speedy recovery. That was weird. The manhood was expected, but the fact that someone sent him a get well card was beyond odd. Why would someone go to the trouble to do that for him? Putting Kaminari's card down, he reached over to the pile he was finally taking in just how big the pile was and picked up a green card with a frog on it. It was clearly from Tsu. Then there was one from Shoji. And one from Ida. And another from Koda. And one from Yuraraka. What the fuck was going on? Before he could fall into an existential crisis at the newfound reality of his classmates thinking about him in any capacity that earned well wishes, the door slid open and four of said classmates entered the room. Dude, you're finally awake, Sato observed with a grin. We've been waiting on pins and needles all week. If Minta wasn't confused before, Siro's excitement would have sent him into a tailspin. Following Sato into the room was Shoji, Siro, and Takoyami. Glad that you're awake, Maita, Shoji said, the sincerity in his voice hitting the short boy like a truck. What are you guys doing here, he questioned, managing to silence the maelstrom whirling in his brain for just long enough to get the words out. We're here to check up on you, bro, Siro answered with his trademark toothy grin. It's good to see you in good health, my friend. Takoyami remarked with a nod. And besides, we could all use the screen time, Siro added. It took a moment for Takoyami's final words to register in Minta's still mildly foggy brain, but when they did, he froze. The words, my friend, were deafening, and they ricocheted around his mind like a pinball at hypersonic speed. When the implications of the utterance finally set in, it took every ounce of strength in his veins to choke back the tears that were threatening to spill out of him. He couldn't cry in front of the boys. He'd never live it down. Anyway, how are you feeling? Shoji asked before Minta could question Siro's statement, not like the boy was paying attention. Oh, um, I'm all right, I guess, he lamely answered with a scratch to the balls on his head. My chest is a little sore and my arms a bit stiff but I'm good otherwise. That's awesome, Sato grinned with a pound of his fist into his palm. Shoji told us all about what you did camp. Didn't know you had it in you all this time. The mention of the forest snapped his brain back to something crucial. Did we rescue Midoriya? Yeah, he's fine, Shoji assured the boy out of his temporary panic. He's down the hall. We were headed there next. You should have been there, man, Siro began. Midoriya's mom took on the League of Villains by herself and was winning before we even stepped in to grab our class rep. It was so awesome. I've been trying to tell Takoyami that Mr. Azawa wouldn't stand a chance, Sato spoke up with a laugh, elbowing his raven-headed classmate. None of the teenagers noticed the sleeping bag in the corner twitch. We should not underestimate our homeroom teacher, Tokoyami sagely replied. Although, I will admit, she was rather frightening when weaponizing her maternal fury. I wonder if she could punt Minta as far as Shoji could, Siro joked, causing the others to laugh and a faint blush to develop on Minta's face at the reminder. Oh, he told you guys about that, huh? Minta chuckled before he turned to the boy in question. I knew you were strong, but I hadn't imagined you could kick that hard. Shoji shrugged. I was always excluded from playing baseball growing up or any sport involving arms. 
They always said I had an unfair advantage, so I took to sports using my legs instead. At that point, if they still had a problem, it was a skill issue. Another bout of laughter arose before the group fell into comfortable conversation. Minta couldn't fight the content smile that graced his tired face. This was nice. This was good. This was what he wanted. This was what he always wanted. This was friendship. Aizawa, meanwhile, stayed concealed in his sleeping bag, opting not to break up the moment of levity after such a traumatic situation. He could figure out how many of his students he was going to expel for their stunt another time. That night, Izuku was perusing through the deluge of articles written about both the Kamino incident as the media had taken to calling it and his mother, particularly her part in his rescue and the defeat of a supervillain just as powerful as All Might. He had no idea if the media had more information on the man than they should or if it was just sensationalist speculation that happened to possess a grain of truth. Whatever the case, the fact was that Verdant was now a celebrity. It was so surreal to imagine. He still hadn't really processed his own level of fame that he had somehow amassed over the months since his tenure at UA began. So being faced with his very private mother experiencing a measure of fame that absolutely trounced his own was both hilarious and frightening. The irony of her spending her career in the underground dodging attention as much as she could wasn't lost on him. And it certainly wasn't lost on his mother, either. Earlier that evening, she texted him to tell him that she was hounded for autographs the minute she left the hospital after the extra tests they ran on him. And it took a swift and surprising intervention from Hawks of all people to create cover for her to slip away. Izuku supposed that he just happened to be in the area and decided to help out, which was nice of him. It was honestly surprising that she garnered so much notoriety considering that All Might was also present. Izuku figured that, if anything, All Might would have absorbed most of that attention, which was the case for Gran Torino. He didn't see or hear anyone mention the old man's presence at all, so his mother's newfound celebrity status was rather strange. He'd have to think more on it later, though. Even he thought that the idea of his mother's popularity being signal boosted by some other party was just a little too paranoid. In the meantime, he indulged in reading the general public's thoughts about the situation on social media. It should turn out to be pretty amusing. Endeavor is a bottom. If this is her post-retirement, I'm afraid to imagine what she was like in her prime. SP Susan Kai, is this what having a heroine idol that isn't a sex symbol is like? Five finger death touch, I mean I guess she's kinda cool or whatever. Her plain somniac, Eraserhead could take her. Future Revision 420, Step On. Actually, maybe it wasn't such a great idea to scour through social media. Not everybody needed a platform. Just as Izuku quit his scrolling, he received a text, and he smiled when he saw that it from was Vanta. He really enjoyed hearing from her and the others from the VRP. Dude, I thought we were friends. Well, that was strange. He didn't think he did or said anything to upset her recently, but maybe he had? How could you not tell me that your mom was a hot, retired pro? That's like essential information. Izuku groaned. This was going to get old very quickly. He could already tell. Vanta, I swear to Matatabi. Matatabi? Oh, right. Only he and a few others knew about the death god inhabiting his quirk. Long story, they're a cat deity. Wicked. We need more representation out there. That brought out a snort from the green head. Vanta would probably get along really well with Gyro or Takage. That thought made him shudder, though, as unlikely as it ever was to happen. He made a mental note to never introduce Vanta to Takage. His attention was recaptured when she sent a follow up text. How was being kidnapped? Honestly? It wasn't so bad. Got to spend time with some long-lost family, evolved my quirk, and even made a supervillain rage quit. I could do without the large, older man groping me, though. Now, if that ain't a mood, Idik what is? Right? A brief moment passed before what she said finally sank in. We're gonna have to talk about that at some point, you know. 
You fucking wish lol. The mood in the Todoroki estate the next morning was awkward, and Shoto couldn't quite figure out why. All their father had said to them before they left was to watch the press conference he was set to do that morning and to not leave the house under any circumstances. Fayami, the warrior that she was, questioned him about the peculiar instructions, but he just assured them that he'd answer their questions when he returned home. Shoto could gather that something rather noteworthy was going to happen, but he had no idea what it could possibly have been and no amount of time consulting his cork board of theories was helping to crack the case. It was one of the sporadic weekends that Natsuo was home to visit, so that likely contributed to the tension in the house. There was always tension whenever he and their father were in the same room, and being instructed to not leave the house didn't quite sit well with Natsuo, but he nonetheless complied. He wasn't silent about his complaints, though, not that Shoto or Fayumi, for that matter could really blame him. Not knowing what else to do and not having anything better to do, the Todoroki family gathered in the living room with snacks as the time for the press conference neared. Without knowing what to expect, the most that was possible was sitting down in front of the TV and observing the spectacle, so that's what Shoto did. With a bowl of cold soba in hand, he plopped down in his seat and waited to find out just what his father deemed so important that they had to watch but not be present for. When it began, the first thing the three siblings noticed was how packed the press room was, and it wasn't even a small press room to begin with. Shoto recognized it from his week interning with his father at his agency. Reporters from all over the nation were present Shoto thought that one of them might have had blue skin, but he wasn't really paying attention and they all focused their attention on the arrival of the No. Two Hero. He was in full hero regalia, the flames on his stern face burning brightly as he made his way onto the elevated platform and sat at the table to face the press. To his right was Burnin, her usual manic grin nowhere in sight. The solemnness dressing her face in its place was unnerving, especially to Fayumi, who was very accustomed to Burnin's fiery and excitable temperament. People of Japan, he began in a subdued baritone that was very much unlike him. I am the nation's number two pro hero, the flame hero, Endeavor. You all know that. However, there are things about me that none of you know. For decades, I have not been honest with all of you, the people I have been sworn to protect with my life. The room was paying him rapt attention, as were his children watching at home. He heaved a heavy sigh and the flames that dressed his face like a mask and glorious facial hair that had become his trademark slowly petered out. When they were finally gone, all that remained was an admittedly pathetic mustache. It only completed the morose picture presented to the press and those watching at home. None of them had ever seen the triumphant hero look so defeated, the least of which being his own children. My name is Enji Todoroki, and I am an abuser. The deafening silence within the house that followed his statement was violently interrupted by the clang of Shoto's bowl of soba falling out of his limp grasp. Overhaul was beginning to think that he spent way too much time at his desk. Granted, a liberal application of his quirk could easily remedy his leg falling asleep, but it was the principle of the matter. Yuri wasn't set for any harvesting that day, as he cleared his schedule in preparation for the coming meeting with the League of Villains. As such, he didn't have much to do beyond looking over paperwork and expenses from the shy Hasekai's legitimate businesses. Trigger money wasn't going to launder itself. Overhaul, sir, came a shout from the other side of the door accompanied by a frantic knocking. Overhaul wouldn't admit out loud to being grateful for the distraction. Come in, he ordered to the nondescript grunt that looked both frazzled and winded. He likely ran across the compound for whatever news he had to share. What is it? Overhaul asked the man with a patient facade. But he wasn't particularly interested in waiting for the man to catch his breath in order to speak. You're not gonna fucking believe this. Ray Todoroki was frozen in place in her chair. The whisper of, oh my god, that left her lips barely audible over her husband's words. Her mind was in a frenzy but her body was rooted to her seat in front of the TV in her room that was broadcasting her husband's public expose of the skeletons in their family's closet. 
his explanation of their marriage, his ambitions, and the emotional strife their family endured by his hands. He was admitting to everything. He was revealing every sordid detail about why he wanted to marry and have children with her in the first place. He explained in no uncertain terms how viciously he pushed his children to surpass all might and then discarded them when they couldn't. He struggled through how much he tried for that one success and all but destroyed their family when he finally got it. He even opened up about the loss of Toya. Well, maybe he wasn't revealing everything, as that would include her own failings in the hellish story of the Todoroki family. She was just barely able to register two sets of hands clasping her own on either side, each pair belonging to her sisters in all but blood. She should have known something was amiss when both Inko and Mitsuki came together to visit her this morning. Getting a visit from one of them wasn't out of the ordinary, but both at once. Still, she was glad that they were all together again for however brief this moment would be. She tried to maintain a brave face and hold on to the numbness she had been feeling for so long, but the four arms that wrapped around her when she started shaking were confirmation that she needed them now more than ever. Tamira's eye twitched in his spot on the couch, or what was left of the couch. The hideout they had commandeered after their escape from Camino was now in flames, the entire building burning a bright blue and coming down on all sides around them. They had been watching Endeavor's press conference out of morbid curiosity, and boy did they get more than they fucking bargained for. There were quirk marriages, selective breeding, spousal and child abuse, and they could even throw in government corruption to cover it all up on top of that. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy, right? The shit that came to light straight from the horse's mouth was one thing, but Dabai fucking flipping his shit and literally exploding before storming out of the building was another thing entirely. Compress had to seal Spinner and Magni away just in time to save them from getting roasted by proximity in the chaos, and even he barely dodged the support beam that came crashing down soon after. Tamira would dust the patchy fuck the next time he saw him. This was a good hideout. Now they needed to find a new spot before the meeting with that shitty Yakuza group twice was babbling about. And it was all because Dabai decided to throw a Gotham tantrum for who fucking knows why. Kurajiri appeared beside Tamura's small, unharmed place on the couch. Shall I find us new accommodations? Tamura turned and gave the man a side-eyed glare. What the hell do you think? Effective immediately, Burnin will step into the position of overseeing the Endeavor Agency. Both the agency and your safety will all be left in her capable hands. Hawk stared at the screen with his mouth agape, and that wasn't just because he was mid-bite on his raw drumstick. He knew Madam President would have his head if she found out that he was eating raw chicken again. But the cravings were insatiable, and it was his one allotted day off for the next two months. He didn't have to go on patrol, he didn't have to knock out some petty criminals, he didn't even have to go out and keep an eye on the Midoriya family which was a task in and of itself, as Inko Midoriya was paranoia personified. He could just sit back in his living room and relax for the day. That was the plan, anyway. He did not quite imagine going into it that he would be spending his day off watching Endeavor confess to domestic abuse and homemade eugenics in front of the entire nation. Excuse him if that wasn't on his pro-heroics bingo card, from Endeavor specifically, at least. If a pro-hero the nations know, two hero, at that publicly admitting to scummy behavior behind closed doors while only alluding to actual crimes committed wasn't bad enough. That same pro throwing the entire governing body of the heroics industry under the bus alongside him was a whole other shitstorm entirely, a shitstorm that he would inevitably have to get involved in. He'd more than likely be doing even more morally questionable things that he didn't particularly enjoy doing. If he was being honest, there were a lot of things that he didn't enjoy doing that were for the safety of the public these days. The vibrations of his phone on his counter were like a death knell in his ears, and one glance at the caller ID told him what he already knew. He heaved a sigh not unlike the one Endeavor released before he began his spiel, and he stood up to get into costume. It was a nice day off while it lasted. 
Endeavor quickly left the press room amid the frenzy of reporters clamoring for answers to their sea of questions, pointedly ignoring them as he exited with Vernon and the rest of his PR team following closely behind him. The group walked in silence down the adjacent hallway until they reached an elevator. Endeavor pressed the button and waited, the silence among the group still carrying on. It remained that way for ten agonizing seconds until his irritation reached ahead. You all are free to take the stairs, Endeavor finally spoke up, and the PR team gratefully scattered. Had they left any faster, there would have been a dust cloud in their place. Vernon, however, did not leave. The door eventually opened, and she boarded alongside him. Neither said a word while the elevator carried them to the top floor where his office sat. Whereas the silence before was merely awkward, the atmosphere in the cramped space was now tense. Soon, the door opened, and the two exited to approach Endeavor's office, both parties' lips still remaining shut until the door to the spacious office closed behind them. I meant what I said in there, Endeavor finally spoke up, peering down at his uncharacteristically mute sidekick. A few more seconds of silence passed before Vernon turned to look up at him with a harsh gaze. Which part, exactly? Endeavor minutely flinched. He supposed he deserved that one, and he technically was no longer her boss, so he couldn't reprimand her for it. Not that he would have, anyway. The part about leaving the Endeavor agency to you in my absence, he clarified. I trust you. Again, Vernon did not immediately respond. She chewed on her thoughts for a few seconds before speaking. Ordinarily, glowing praise like that would make me feel all fuzzy inside. Endeavor sighed. Despite the circumstances, he knew he shouldn't have been surprised to receive snark from Vernon. Perhaps that was a good sign. Why did you decide to stay? He finally asked her. I wouldn't have begrudged you if you opted to leave the agency. And many had. Endeavor informed all of his sidekicks about the entire situation the night prior, and he gave them the option to leave the agency if they desired. Of his 33 sidekicks, only 12 remained, and the lion's share of them only did so conditionally. She turned to face him fully, the glare she was shooting him burning with indignation almost as brightly as her hair. What does you tarnishing your own legacy have to do with me helping people in need? Well, he supposed that was all the answer he needed. I made the right choice, then, Endeavor declared with a nod. Vernon snorted, and she looked away, staring out into the city through the office's absurdly large windows. A sigh escaped her, and she looked back at her former boss. How long are you gonna be, you know, stepping away? Endeavor silently mulled over the question. In the press conference, he told the public that he would be stepping away from the public eye in order to begin the process of atonement, not only for his family, but for all of the people who placed their trust in him that he failed. When Japan needs the flame hero, I will be there. However, in the meantime, I need to address and make up for the damage I've done and the people I've hurt. So, this is less of a retirement and more of a self-imposed exile, while your kids kick the shit out of you, she asked. In so many words, yes, Endeavor sighed, too used to Burnin's lack of decorum. Burnin smiled, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. Bitchin, maybe by the time you're back, you'll have grown a full mustache. I wish you the best of luck, Burnin, Endeavor deadpanned as he walked away from the desk and towards the exit. I'll do my best to keep the seat warm, she quipped as he made his way out, Endeavor stopped in his tracks and looked back at her. For who? It's your agency, now. With that, he walked through the open door, closing it behind him and leaving Vernon standing in the center of the large office. Now alone, the woman sighed and finally allowed the weight of the long morning's events to set in. A sadistic anticipation snaked up over Hall's spine as he, Mimic, and the remaining five bullets approached the meeting place, he had waited patiently more or less for this day to come, and now, it was here. He'd get to wipe the League of Villains off the map, and with them, all for one's remaining influence would die with it, affording him no opposition in snatching the throne of the criminal underworld. 
the Shai Hesekai would rise once again and lead this diseased world back to purity. Yes, it was all coming together so beautifully. Chronostasis had already snuck inside beyond those idiots' notice and was in position to strike. The others were behind him and ready to leap in at a moment's notice to lay waste to the putrid troglodytes that dared interfere with the Shai Hasekai's affairs. All he had to do was walk inside, introduce himself, and then make some examples. The lambs would be sent to slaughter, and he was their shepherd. He was their god. In the brief period that Izuku had been home after he was discharged, he had half a mind to test if he could phase into his couch via osmosis. It was preferable to channel surfing through the onslaught of news coverage of the absurd events that had transpired over the course of the week. It was like one thing after another. There was the attack on the training camp. Camino, his mother becoming an overnight sensation, Endeavor's press conference, and the spat of violent mass murders that sprung up in the aftermath. He suspected that there was an unsavory connection between those last two given what he was able to sniff out in his time as a prisoner. But that was a conversation to have with Shoto at a later date. In other news, betting odds have Mirko potentially hopping into the top three for the next pro hero rankings after Endeavor. Click. Surprise villain attack in which an eruption of blue flames incinerated a city block. Thus far, 67 people have been confirmed dead in the attack. But that number is likely to increase as the search and rescue efforts continue. Of the 22 that were wounded, 9 are in critical condition. The suspect remains at large. Click. Nation is still reeling from Endeavor's shocking press conference and subsequent self-exile from heroics. The number one hero himself, All Might, said in a recent statement condemning both Endeavor and the Hero Public Safety Commission that he will be making a public address of his own regarding both Endeavor's press conference and the Camino incident. Speaking of Camino, green wig sales are up by 300%. Before he could change the channel, his mother materialized beside him and snatched the remote, changing the channel herself. Izuku swore he heard her grumble, fucking fanatics, under her breath as she did so. She was about to say something else, but she paused, and her eyes lit up with an idea before turning to her son. You know what, let's go out to eat, she suggested with a smile. We'll celebrate you being back home. Overhaul stormed into the shy Hasekai compound in an almost palpable rage. The meeting had gone off the rails, but it wasn't in the way that he planned for or expected. When he made his intentions to delete them all from existence clear, a confused man tried to attack him with his magnetism disease. Making quick work of him was a simple matter. What wasn't a simple matter, however, was their leader slamming a hand to the ground and rendering the entire building to rubble, as well as anyone in its path. He was able to use overhaul to negate the decay and rebuild himself before it could spread too far, but everyone he came with wasn't so fortunate. As a result, he was forced to flee the scene with his life, which brought him to his current state of tearing through the compound like an incensed bull in a china shop. Everyone he came across wisely kept their distance or made themselves scarce entirely. That was, of course, until he made it to his office, and someone was already waiting for him. Ah, uh, be boss the skinny man trepidatiously addressed, already knowing in the back of his mind how this interaction would inevitably end. The golden glare he was receiving with more hatred packed into it than he ever thought possible was merely confirmation of his fate being sealed. What? Overhaul growled. He gulped, preparing to make a break for it the second he finished what he was about to say. Eerie escaped again. He didn't get very far. Seconds later, Overhaul was storming out of the hallway that had a fresh coat of red paint even more livid than he had already been. The hives he was developing upon being spattered with blood went ignored in his red haze, and he was single-minded in one pursuit. Eerie, when I find you... I will tear you apart until you're a mindless husk. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate their katsudan in comparison to mine? Inko asked her son from under her blonde wig and hoodie as they walked down the sidewalk towards the parking garage. Izuku hummed from beneath his own blonde wig and hood, 
and he placed a hand on his chin. Seven out of ten, it was good, but there's no beating the original. Damn straight, his mother said with a victorious smile. We should do this more often, Izuku mused. I wasn't really expecting the disguises to work as well as they did. We definitely could, but something ridiculous tends to happen whenever either of us leaves the apartment, Inko joked as the duo strolled past an alleyway. As if on cue, the two simultaneously stopped on a dime and peered into the darkness of the alley. Within moments, the soft, Frantic pitter-patter of small footsteps made itself known to the two, and a small girl with long, unkempt mane of white hair bolted toward them from the abyss. The fear bubbling out of her crimson eyes with her tears immediately put both green heads in disguise on edge, and Izuku quickly turned to kneel down to the approaching girl's level. Her eyes widened even further, and she slammed into his arms and held onto him for dear life. Now that Izuku was able to get a better look at her, an uneasy fusion of concern and anger started to flood his system. Not only was she shivering out of fear or just being cold, he couldn't really be sure, but she was also wearing nothing but a dingy hospital gown, and her arms and legs were covered in bandages. The way she was latched onto him so tightly painted a potentially horrifying picture about this little girl's circumstances. She couldn't have been older than five or six, and he couldn't help but be reminded of Koda. Unfortunately, with the thought of Koda came the images forever burned into his brain of Koda's limp body laying lifelessly in his arms. Izuku's breath hitched, and he felt the girl start to shake even more violently in his grasp. Then Izuku spotted a horn on her forehead in his periphery began to emit a faint, yellow glow, and the little girl began to glow in his arms. Instinctively, he went up in an orange glow of his own, and the girl was quickly wrapped in a thin, orange blanket of flame before the unknown effects of the glow could reach him. No one was more surprised than the girl herself, apparently. She froze and peered down at the strange, orange layer holding her in a warm cocoon, and she absentmindedly snuggled further into it. Her curse also didn't penetrate through the blanket, and that shocked her beyond belief. The only other person who could do something like that was the scary man who made the big, yellow bubbles. Izuku, meanwhile, observed the range of emotions flickering across her face while she inspected the malleable barrier. He didn't know why, but she seemed both fascinated and fearful of his quirk, or maybe it was something else. Perhaps it had to do with the glow coming from her horn. Whatever the case, for the briefest of moments, he thought back to Koda once more. What happened to him was absolutely not going to happen to this girl. Izuku would die before anything like that ever did. There you are, Eri, a menacing growl echoed from the darkness. Out of the pitch black expanse stalked a man with a dark, olive green bomber jacket with a thick, purple fur collar. The most striking thing about him, though, was the intricate plague mask he wore over his mouth that was embroidered with gold the same shade as his hate-filled eyes. If Izuku wasn't on guard before, he was ready to move at a moment's notice now. Nothing about this man screamed, upstanding citizen, and if the way the girl started to hyperventilate at the sound of his voice was any indication, he was who she was running from. You should have stayed in your fucking room, Iri, he snarled, stalking even closer. Now, even more innocent people are going to die because of you. Without warning, he lunged for Izuku and opened his palm, preparing to turn the unfortunate blonde kid and his mother to paste before collecting Iri. Izuku went up in a yellow blaze and was prepared to dodge the attack, refusing to take any chances with touch-based attacks after dealing with both Tamura and Ochako. Izuku's piercing, green gaze met over Hall's wild, golden glare as a violent, destructive battle between two titans felt all but inevitable. In a mere instant, Overhaul disintegrated in the direction slightly adjacent to Izuku and disappeared into the wind. Izuku's eyes were bulging out of his skull, and his jaw had taken up residence on the concrete. Iri was no better, her own jaw resting beside his own. In unison, the two craned their heads to look at Inko, her arm outstretched with her palm glowing and her own eyes shining a deadly emerald upon the spot where the man had once existed. 
When she noticed their gazes, she turned a curious one toward her son. What? Izuku's brain dam near short-circuited at the casual inquiry. Don't what me, you just atomized a man. He was threatening you, she shrugged. Izuku legitimately sputtered before regaining himself and finding his words. Why didn't you do that to the League for kidnapping me? There were witnesses, Izuku, Inko chided as if the answer was obvious. I couldn't just summarily execute an entire group of villains while the Hero Commission is doing surveillance on us in our home. I don't want to give them even more ammo than they already have. Come again? Izuku asked in a dark tone, and Inko immediately paled upon realizing her mistake. Oh, right. I never actually told you about that, she sheepishly admitted. I didn't want to worry you during your trip to I Island, and everything that happened afterward kinda took precedence. Izuku closed his eyes and took a deep breath at the explanation. Now was not the time, they had other matters to attend to. We can deal with that later. What do we do about this little girl? Iri, having quietly observed the two's discussion, had already made up her mind that she wasn't going to detach herself from the teen anytime soon. The display of his mother literally wiping the man who had been terrorizing her for as long as she could remember out of existence only reinforced her desire to stick around with them. They were safe, safer than anything she had ever experienced since she made her dad disappear. The scary bird man tried to kidnap me from my mommy and big brother, she spoke up gaining the surprise and confusion of the two. Erm, what? Izuku asked, unsure what she was getting at. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it, she declared with a resolute expression. Her valiant attempt to appear headstrong and determined was one of the most adorable visuals Inko had ever witnessed, and she was immediately sold. She reached into her pocket and pulled out her phone before dialing the one person she could go to that could help them navigate the absurd predicament they found themselves in. Nezu, you're still at Yua, right? Omek, Meta Liberation Army Group Chat. Getten, Endeavor Press 4. Getten, Based. Skeptic, Getten. Getten, okay, but hear me out though, Based, right? Trumpet, Getten PLS. Curious, I think it's pretty based. Skeptic, do not encourage him. Gettin, see, curious always gets it. Kusari, I mean, it's not the way I'd personally go about it, but I can't knock selective breeding to create the most powerful meta. Seems pretty based to me. Redistro, I concur. When I was a young lad, my giant, pet cockroach, Horfrost, was created in a similar fashion. He was very based as was the garlic ice cream we often enjoyed together. Gettin, it appears you're outnumbered. Endeavor is based by simple majority. Trumpet, sometimes I truly feel like I am the only neurotypical in this organization. Overhaul felt nothing. He was drifting weightlessly in a void, and he could hardly recall what happened after he got back to the shy Hasekai compound. His mind was in such a fog that even his own identity felt extremely fluid. It took an exorbitant amount of effort that he managed to dredge up from who knows where in order to get a grip on any concept of self and regain his senses to assess his current situation. When he could finally observe his surroundings without the compulsion to scream through his existential crisis with no mouth, he slowly craned his head to take a long look out and around the void. Just about the only thing he could make out for miles was the cool glow of the sapphire flames burning below him. Well, perhaps burning wasn't the right word, as he felt no heat coming from the flames. Then again, he still couldn't truly feel anything at all, as if he was past the point of being ethereal. It was so incredibly perplexing, as was the sapphire flames crescendoing in luminosity below him. He watched in muted fascination as the flames danced and swelled about, intermingling and crashing about in a fiery ocean. Then, the flames intensified, casting a much more vibrant glow on his form, and they opened up like an eldritch abomination peering into his very existence. To the transfixed overhaul, it was almost as if the flames were alive and reacting to something. They were... Kai Chisaki, 
a smooth, deadly intonation filled every fiber of his ethereal being and rattled the bones he knew weren't present but could still feel. His eyes were as wide as dinner plates at the usage of his real name in such a strange environment, and his wide, golden gaze was met by the opening of two pools below him. Blue flames surrounded two bright, slitted eyes of different colors that held nothing but unspoken horrors, malice, and merciless terror deep within them. He was fixed in his spot in space as a hulking figure rose from the fire, the two eyes rising with it, and standing before Overhaul was a massive, two-tailed cat wearing pristine, white robes and red prayer beads around its neck. The wicked, Cheshire grin he was receiving from the creature gave him hundreds of jagged reasons to fear his predicament. Ordinarily, I would simply eat you, but you truly intrigue me, Kai Chisaki, the cat spoke, revealing itself to be the owner of the frightening voice and the knowledge of his true identity. You had the ability to manipulate matter at your will. With the slightest touch, you could obliterate, repair, or merely reconfigure whatever you please. It's such a fascinating power to wield, particularly how you used it. The cat's grin grew even sharper filling overhaul with the deepest of dread. What is more interesting is your philosophy towards the state of your human society. You abhorred the proliferation of quirks and maligned them as diseases, and yet your own disease was such a fundamental aspect of your very existence. You were as diseased as the rest of humanity, yet you saw fit to cure them all of their sicknesses and guide the new world order to salvation. The death god's grin took on an even more threatening edge, and their slitted pupils narrowed into blades primed to cut overhaul down where he floated. Your quirk, one that allowed you to all but rewrite matter as you so desired with merely a touch made you powerful, your stolen empire of loyal subjects made you influential, and your greater ambitions for a restoration of the old made you a visionary, there was a momentary pause where Matatabi's piercing stare did not make bones about the utter disdain that was held for the man before them. You fancied yourself a god. Those five words hung around Overhaul's neck like a noose. It told him everything he needed to know about his situation. His fate wasn't just sealed, it was welded shut. Well, how about I show you what true godhood looks like? Matatabi purred dangerously as they loomed over the man nearly salivating at the fear that was bursting out of his gaze. Overhaul was still rooted in his spot in space, not able to move a muscle as his imminent doom drew closer and closer with a perverse glee. Matatabi lowered their giant head to bring it a rough approximation of eye level with Overhaul, and only then did their grin finally drop. It was the most frightening thing Overhaul had ever witnessed. Welcome to my world, bitch. It had been a while since Nezu's smile made Izuku nervous. He almost missed it. On the one hand, it was familiar enough to give him comfort, and that was sorely needed with how comically hectic the last week had been for everyone in his life. On the other hand, however, it was familiar enough to compel him to pack everything he owned and put a few oceans distance between himself and whatever this devilish creature was cooking up. The fact that the quirked animal was sitting behind his desk and staring right at him with his beady eyes accompanying his unnerving smile without saying a single word was only making it worse. He couldn't even fathom why Nezu was screwing with him like this. Eerie shifted in his lap as she turned the page of the coloring book from within a warm blanket, both of which his mother had bought for her on the way to Yua. Okay, he could kind of fathom why Nezu was screwing with him. He and his mother had stumbled upon an abused child in an alley and murdered her abuser on the spot. Granted, it was self-defense, at least on Izuku's part. The point was that it was an addition to the growing list of cover-ups involving the Midoriya family, not that Nezu had much of an issue with that in principle. On top of that, though, the details of Eri's confinement were troubling to say the least. Apparently, the man they had rescued Ere from was part of the Yakuza and he was a rather notorious figure in the growing trigger trade of Tokyo. From Eri's description, Nezu was able to link him to the details he knew of Sir Naitai's investigation of the Shai Hesekai, and the man in question from Mirio Tagata's descriptions of his work-study with the former sidekick of All Might. The real troubling parts were what Overhaul had been doing to Eri. 
when asked about her bandages and her ratty hospital gown, she would retreat into herself and start to shake. It was only the tender touch of Izuku's hand softly running through her hair and across her scalp that began to ease her little by little, and she was able to open up about her experiences a bit more. She still didn't go into a lot of detail, however, immediately tipping the other three off that what the man was doing was exceptionally traumatic. Inko would not apologize for just casually erasing him. So, Izuku could maybe understand why Nezu was screwing with him, and his mother choosing not to break the silence and comfortably sipping her tea with her legs crossed wasn't helping matters whatsoever. Fortunately, he was rescued by the bundled-up girl in his poking his chest to get his attention, and she gave him an inquisitive, doe-eyed stare as she did her best to lean in. Is he an animal or a manimal? Iri asked in a failed attempt to be inconspicuous, pointing directly at the principal. Just like that, the nervous tension Nezu was trying to create was shattered like sugar glass on a movie set. Neither Izuku nor his mother dared fight the giggle fit they were thrust into, and that seemed to lighten Iri's mood even more after having to peel back the curtain into her life. I am an animal with a quirk, little one, Nezu kindly answered, genuinely amused by the girl's question. Now, am I a dog, a mouse, or a bear? Iri furrowed her brow in thought as she analyzed the creature before her. Her face was the picture of furious concentration in her attempt to figure him out, and Inko had to hold herself back from melting at the sight. This is a trick question, she finally answered with a frown. You're a weasel. Nezu's eyes widened, and he quickly cleared his throat. Moving on, so you need me to forge adoption papers. If you'd be so kind, Inko confirmed with a nod, completely ignoring her son's frantic attempts to try to draw attention to what had just happened. That can be squared away by the end of the week, Nezu nodded, also pointedly ignoring his protege. In the meantime, there is another matter that must be addressed while I have you both here. And that is, Inko questioned. Nezu's usual smile returned. To unveil my plan that has been in the works since I was informed of our hero commission's rather generous off-hours oversight. Again, we're gonna have to talk about that later, Mom, Izuku reminded with a frown. And we will, she sighed in defeat. What's your plan, rat? We'll be fully instituting a dormitory system for our students using the existing on-campus housing, just greatly expanded to suit the new influx of residents. We can kill two birds with one stone by not only better ensuring the safety of our students, but also eliminating any HPSC home surveillance from the equation, Nezu explained. That makes sense, Inko nodded. I imagine that you're going to need to gain permission from parents to house their children. Indeed, Nezu confirmed. Because you, as well as Irie, will also be moving in, Izuku is already accounted for. However, I intend to get all Hero Core students moved by the start of the semester, so I'm having Aizawa and Ken go out and meet with the parents of the first years personally. Would you like to join them? Inko was initially confused about why he'd request that of her. He understood why the homeroom teachers of the two first-year classes would go, but she didn't quite understand why he'd ask the upper-class underground heroics teacher to do so. Inko's expression became as dry as the desert when it finally hit her. You're leveraging my fame to subconsciously muscle the parents into agreeing, aren't you? See, Izuku's intelligence had to come from somewhere, Nezu cackled with a newfound cup of tea in hand. Inko facepalmed and massaged her temple with her other hand. Why not just send Yagi to do that as all might? Yagi will be preoccupied with his own public address this week, Nezu plainly stated, slightly shifting in his seat before taking a sip of his tea. Both mother and son stared at the quirked animal intently. While the statement itself wasn't ominous, Nezu's disposition was somewhat concerning. On a scale of one to endeavor, what kind of address should we expect? Izuku cautiously asked. Nezu sighed and leaned back into his chair, placing his cup of tea down and lacing his paws together. That depends entirely on one's perspective, I suppose. I advised him against doing so, especially with everything going on currently, 
but he insisted that it was time. His reasoning was admittedly sound. Well, that certainly wasn't at all foreboding. Too many things were coming together to paint a potentially disastrous picture in Izuku's opinion. Melissa's presence in Japan in tandem with her bandaged arms and receiving an offer that she couldn't refuse. Izuku really didn't like what was potentially on the horizon. When he felt a light tug on his collar, he looked down at the little girl in his lap trying to get his attention. Her bright, red eyes were brimming with curiosity. Who's all might? Hawks slumped in his seat at the long, black conference table. It couldn't have been a more uncomfortable morning. The atmosphere in the room was a lead suit jacket on every single person present, even those not wearing suits. Junji Mishima sat to his right, the man's usually combed, dark gray hair a frazzled mess to complement his apprehension. Yokimuro Mira looked even more sleep-deprived than usual at the edge of the table, and he didn't even bother with a tie for his baggy, ruffled suit. The heavily armored form of Yoroi Musher right across from Hawks tried his best to maintain an unflappable, stoic countenance, but Hawks could easily parse the minute twitches of the man's beard as signs of his discomfort. At the head of everything was Madam President herself. Gone was her trademark steely stoicism that never belied what she was truly thinking before she said anything, and even after she said anything. Granted, her current demeanor wasn't dangerously expressive on its own, but the air of cold fury emanating from her slightly narrowed, turquoise gaze and almost frown had frozen everyone to their seats. If Hawks knew nothing else, he knew right then that she was absolutely livid in that moment. I don't believe I have to tell you all that this is approaching a worst-case scenario, she intoned in a dangerous monotone. Hawks was more than a little bit perplexed at that. Sure, the nations know. Two pro-hero outing himself as an abuser and exposing the HPSC's complicit and active hand in covering it up was really bad. The general public's heavy lambasting of the commission and rising loss of trust in heroics wasn't great, either. The mountain of pro-heroes and sidekicks coming out to decry the actions of Endeavor and the commission including the Gotham No. One hero himself was a terrible look. Worst case scenario, though, Hawks figured that designation would be left to All Might turning villain or a surprise MLA invasion. Hell, maybe even the Midoriya family and Nezu collaborating with an insurgent army of pro-heroes to depose the government would be closer to an actual worst case than what they have now. I see some of you aren't entirely convinced, she spoke up again, her cold tone silencing any thoughts that anyone may have been having. Hawks fidgeted despite himself. She didn't say it or even look in his direction, but he knew that she was directing that comment at him. She always had a sixth sense when it came to thoughts she found uncouth in any manner. Allow me to recontextualize the current situation, she continued, her icy gaze trapping the entirety of the room. In one fell swoop, the Hero Public Safety Commission lost its non-political leverage over the number two hero, his agency, and his influence, as well as public support tanking across the board as the days go on. The issue of public support would be a non-factor if this wasn't a calculated strike against the HPSC. Not only had Endeavor publicly confessed to his transgressions completely unprompted, but he took great care to heavily implicate but not directly state that he had help in keeping his family turmoil away from public or legal scrutiny. By not directly shirking the responsibility and merely laying some of it at the feet of associated parties, he created the perfect conditions for the public to direct their vitriol at us and feel as though they did so on their own volition. Her eyes narrowed a centimeter more, her turquoise pupils remaining chips of ice at the head of the table. It was entirely too coordinated to be merely coincidental. A heavy silence set amongst the room as her words sunk in. Hawks could begin to understand her rationale for deeming this to be nearing a worst-case scenario, even if he didn't quite agree just yet. Are you suggesting that Endeavor is acting directly against us? A man towards the other end of the table hesitantly asked. The minute shake of Madam President's head was sufficient enough to declare the contrary. It's more likely that Endeavor was just being used as a convenient pawn in a larger game. 
it was Miss Hema that spoke up this time. Then who is pulling the strings? Her eyes shifted to land on Miss Hema, and the man regretted speaking up. Is that not obvious? It's Nezu, the biggest thorn in our side that can't yet legally be declared a villain. All right, Hawks could concede that it was becoming a little bit more concerning. The Commission and Nezu and Yue by proxy had been waging a long-standing Cold War for a good amount of time. Nezu was completely opposed to the HPSC's existence in its current form, and the HPSC would rather Nezu and his unquestionable influence in shaping young heroes be off the board entirely. However, both sides were more beneficial to the other alive and functional than they were dead at the current moment. Given the existence of common enemies such as the MLA and, more recently, the League of Villains and All for One. Just as well, Nezu rarely ever left Yue, so silencing him was difficult at the best of times, and declaring open war on the HPSC would do nothing but launch the nation into a vicious civil war. So, yeah, cold wars and proxy wars were the way to go, as true cooperation was a pipe dream at best. I see that some of you are starting to get it, Madam President commented, and Hawks felt another shiver crawl up his spine. Nezu is manufacturing societal conditions to slowly chip away at the public's trust in the Bureau that keeps heroics afloat. But would that not simply undermine heroics in totality? Yoroi Musha found the courage to ask. Musha and Hawks were two of a handful of pros in the conference room that were trusted enough by the top brass to be in the loop for code red situations, of which this apparently happened to be one. Some others in the room were X Less, Air Jet, and Mr. Brave, so not anyone too high up on the totem pole, excluding himself and Musha, but all were heroes whose skills and natural abilities were effective at assassinations if necessary. Hawks really tried not to think about that. No, he takes great care not to harm the public's trust in heroics itself, Madam President sternly corrected. Rather, he'll shake the foundations of the status quo, while pushing a more populist notion for people to latch onto, making himself and his allies appear more appealing all the while. You can see this with Endeavor, the consistent presence of Izuku Midoriya, and the ideas he brings in the public consciousness. The newfound and pervasive presence of Inko Midoriya in the public consciousness, hiring All Might as a teacher for the most prestigious hero academy in the nation, etc. What doing so accomplishes is diverting the public's trust away from our hand in heroics, while preserving the institution enough to allow for himself and his allies to fill the remaining vacuum. If our public approval rating becomes dangerously low, then disruptors with a vested interest in our destruction will take the opportunity to galvanize other disruptors, influence the minds of the general public even further, and sway pro-heroes that aren't specifically aligned with us to coalesce against us. That possibility should never arise. However, radical ideologies pushed forth by anarchists, such as the Meta Liberation Army, terrorists such as Stain and the swell of villains he emboldened, and idealists with too much influence, such as Izuku Midoriya, make that event a greater possibility every day. The silence that followed was heavy once more. As much as he hated it, Hawks had to admit that the logic was sound. Scarily so. It always was. So, what's our next move, then? Mira sighed, not even pretending to hide his exhaustion. I have no doubt that Nezu will advocate for Izuku Midoriya to take the coming provisional license exam, despite his status as a first-year hero student, Madam President clinically began with her fingers steepled. A situation where Izuku Midoriya was to fail to obtain a provisional license and be gravely injured all the while, assuming that information was to become public, would not only spotlight a failure in his own acumen, but also on the part of the institution that groomed and showcased him for a path that he simply was not cut out for. Then, something horrible happened, and the entirety of the room felt a bottomless pit open up in their stomachs. The unfathomable quantity of dread that filled their hearts at the sight that wickedly greeted them would remain fixed in their psyche as for the rest of their unsightly, miserable lives. Madam President was smiling. If Nezu wishes to shake the public's trust in the Hero Public Safety Commission, 
then we will shake the public's trust in Yue as an institution. Do keep in mind that Nezu's reputation is only as solid as U.S., and there is a directly proportional correlation between them. The soft sound of hawk's feathers scraping against the back of his chair as they ruffled in apprehension wandered into his own ears. He didn't fear a lot of things in life, but there would never be a day where Madam President smiling didn't make him feel like little more than a velociraptor watching a meteorite hurtle towards the planet. Knock knock. No. Come on, your Amshi, humor me. The tired corrections officer sitting at his desk sighed a portion of his soul away, as he knew that entertaining his red-headed co-workers' incessant jokes only encouraged him to continue them later. On the same token, allowing him to make his dumb jokes was the only way to get them out of his system so that he'd shut up. Who's there? He finally gave in. The other co grinned like a predator that just caught its prey. Boo. Boo, who? The fuck are you crying for? It's just a joke. The red-headed co cackled as Yuramshi's head plunked down onto the desk. You legitimately make my existence unbearable came the muffled voice of Yuramshi. Don't be such a baby, the other co snickered as a third co wandered by the two, pushing a cart of dinner trays along his way. Hey, new guy, you want to hear a joke? I promise you, I'd rather die, the third co responded without turning around or breaking his stride whatsoever. Smart man, Yuramshi muttered as the man continued on his way. The new guy in question had long, Black hair partially tucked away in a cap that barely did anything to prevent a few loose bangs from hanging over his dull, brown eyes. He meandered down the hall towards the secure housing unit where unstable, high-profile, or otherwise vulnerable inmates were housed in isolation. Rolling the cart along, the unassuming Ko did his duty by sliding the dinner trays through the slots in the cell doors, checking off each inmate and cell number as he did so. 311, 312, 313, on and on it went until he was standing before cell 321. Once there, he stopped and stared intently at the number printed on the door. Seemingly confirming something to himself, he reached into a pocket on his uniform and retrieved a small vial. Unscrewing the small cap on the vial, he grabbed the next available tray and sprinkled a white, powdery substance into the small bowl of barley rice as well as mixing some of it into the small bowl of miso soup on the tray for good measure. Then, he pocketed the vial and slid the tray through the slot. Only when the tray was taken from the other side did he finally move on to the next cell. Inko sighed as she put away her phone texting her son to ensure that he'd be all right with Iri back at the apartment while she and Aizawa were out canvassing the parents of 1A. She wasn't so worried about their safety, so to speak. She knew that if, say, a giant, shape-shifting villain was to attack the apartment complex, Izuku could probably handle it and keep Iri safe from harm. What worried her was her son's ability to look after a damaged child, if even for a single afternoon. She knew from experience that trauma was a difficult monster to battle, and Iri had a lot of it. Fortunately, Izuku was brilliant, compassionate, and otherworldly empathetic, so she was confident that he'd try his damnedest to build sturdy mental and emotional bridges between them. Still, though, dealing with the trauma of a person who likely couldn't quite make sense of what they were feeling or what they really experienced was a different animal entirely than that of an adult. She'd just have to have faith in him. Granted, the way that she more or less adopted and imprinted on them almost immediately was a good sign. She didn't seem reclusive or too closed off around them in the very brief time they'd spent with her. Regardless, there was no further use agonizing over it. She had faith in her son and in the little horned bundle of unrefined adorable, and she still had the task at hand to focus on. Nezu was kind enough to provide her and Aizawa with a dedicated driver to chauffeur them to and from the residences of each student, but there was still a considerable amount to travel to. Speaking of, how many of these do we have to do? Inko asked her temporary partner in crime. Nineteen, Aizawa replied before pausing and looking toward Inko. Do you give your son permission to live on campus? 
Aizawa was impressed with the sheer magnitude of deadpan that the look he received from his idle er co-worker contained. If this was how Mike felt around him, he had to admit, it was sort of amusing. 18. Then, he concluded with a small smirk. Get out of the fucking car. Heard we lost another inmate last night, a co said to another as the two walked in stepped down a hallway towards the break room. Yeah, that kid with the tail who was spying on you are for villains, the other confirmed. Poor bastard just keeled over in his cell mid-meal. They found his body earlier this morning. Shit, man, the first co winced. I'd hate to be the guy to have to bring that news to his parents. The second co shook his head. That's the thing, they already kicked the bucket. Apparently, they committed seppuku in their home, couldn't deal with the shame of their kid being a villain. Well, fuck. Fuck is right. As the two turned the corner into the break room, they were blissfully unaware of the third set of feet trailing soundlessly behind them. The owner of those feet smiled, brushing the loose, black bangs away from his eyes. I warned you not to become a liability. Tail, the man chuckled to himself as he turned around and strolled the opposite direction. Now, on to the next. Izuku sat cross-legged on the couch beside the newest addition to the Midoriya family. The first thing his mother did when they got back to the apartment was to get Iri out of the hospital gown and into proper clothes, which just meant that Izuku's old clothes were repurposed for the time being. Currently, Iri was sporting Izuku's old All Might onesie while sitting on the couch with her newly adopted brother. She was having a bit of difficulty really fathoming her new situation after everything had calmed down. Merely a day after escaping the worst captivity imaginable, she found herself in a warm, safe environment with the people who rescued her. The culture shock was a lot to handle, even if she was the one who inserted herself into the new environment. Not that she regretted it in the slightest. Still, though, it felt really weird. She found herself defaulting to sitting in silence to avoid being noticed even though she had nothing to fear, since that's just what she was used to doing. Then, she felt a large hand softly caress her head, and she set her big, doe eyes onto the teen beside her. She felt significantly better upon seeing the warm, bright smile he was sending her way. So... What do you like to do? Izuku asked, his reassuring smile masking the fact that he had absolutely no idea what he was doing. Oh, um, Iri was taken aback by the question. She never really had a lot to do when she was with Overhaul. The scary men who worked for him usually gave her toys to keep her occupied, but they never really made her all that comfortable. She liked to draw, but she wasn't really feeling it at that moment. Then, another thought occurred to her when she glanced at the TV in front of them. She never got to watch TV very often. Izuku noticed her gaze, and he nodded and cut on the TV with the remote. They were greeted by the boisterous laugh of All Might as an animated depiction of him rescued a group of civilians from a hulking fish man. It was a rerun of the long-running All Might animated series, of which Izuku had unashamedly seen every episode. Iri's attention was immediately fixed to the screen, mostly due to the bright colors, but the triumphant display of All Might protecting the innocent from evil and valiantly defeating Deep Sea King was nothing short of mesmerizing to the little girl who had wished for a hero her entire life. Looking over at Izuku, a soothing warmth began to blossom within. Seeing him and thinking about Inko, the hero she had always wished for had finally come. The crack she had slipped through wasn't too deep after all. So lost in her reverie was she that she nearly missed the bombastic commercial that was broadcasted after the battle, featuring a giant, reptilian creature towering over the tallest skyscrapers in Tokyo. Standing across from it on top of one of the skyscrapers was All Might, his fists placed on his hips in his signature pose as he stared down the kaiju. All Might vs. Godzilla? coming to theaters this Christmas. Izuku snorted. Can't wait to rub it in Takage's face and put this to bed forever. Iri gazed in wonder at the screen, then she turned to Izuku. Who's Godzilla? He's a super powerful kaiju who can wipe out whole cities with ease, Izuku answered. Oh, Iri replied in thought. 
Could All Might beat Godzilla? Yes, and don't ever let anyone tell you differently. Eerie wasn't sure how much she believed that I can't believe my baby girl is being taught by such a rock star. Technically, I'm not actually her teacher yet, Inko replied to the comically crying Kyotoku Gyro with a bashful scratch to the back of her head. Close enough, the Gyro patriarch insisted with his wife beside him. Then, something occurred to Inko as she gazed at the two. Have we met before? Technically, Mika Gyro answered with a smile. You saved the two of us from a mugger on our first date nearly two decades ago. I'm shocked that you remember. How could she forget yoinking a dude's gun and pistol whipping him until he cried? That shit was metal, Kayotoku spoke up with a laugh. All right, you two, that's more than enough gushing for one morning, the youngest gyro announced as she stepped into the room with a tray of drinks for the two teachers. We already discussed everything when the letter came, and they're both on board with the dorm idea. Damn it, Kayoka, I didn't even get a chance to put on my strict father act, her father complained. Inko only vaguely heard the retort of, put a sock in it, old man, from the teenage girl while she was lost in thought. She remembered the mentioned incident very clearly. It was one of the key factors to realizing that she was losing herself and needed to step away. She never looked back on the moment too fondly, but... Her eyes rested on Kayoka Gyro annoyedly bickering with her dramatically crying father. Izuku's own classmate was likely the result of that moment. Granted, it was probably self-serving to give herself credit for a child's creation, but the possibility existed that the mugger could have killed or seriously harmed them had she not been there to stop him, regardless of how overboard she went. It colored the situation with a perspective that she had never truly considered. She had a lot to think about when she got home. Sir Naitai stared right into Nezu's beady, black eyes with an impassive, unreadable expression. Naitai was a proud man, and he wasn't easy to unsettle. That fact was both a blessing and a curse. However, pride often lended itself to stubbornness, as seen in the fact that he hadn't spoken to his former friend and master, the No, one hero, in over half a decade. Compounded by the fact that the immutable future he saw for the man with his quirk frightened him enough to double down in his thinking, and you get a very estranged relationship between All Might and his former sidekick. Sir Naitai wouldn't allow that to affect him, however, he had a duty as a pro hero to put his personal issues aside to protect the public to the best of his ability, and he did so with gusto. He had faced down all sorts of villains in his day many with substantially more dangerous abilities than he wielded, but they all went down when faced with his unmatched guile. That guile allowed him to match up with some of the most ruthless, calculating, and well-connected scum in the criminal underworld. He was nothing short of experienced. Yet, while it wasn't a vicious, bloodthirsty villain, nor was it a vision of All Might's gruesome, unspeakable death, Nezu's smile unnerved the shit out of Naitai nonetheless. At least he had Mirio's unflappable positivity by his side to ease some of the tension. But damn it could he use a joint right at that minute. I will assume that whatever you had to discuss in person was imperative enough to warrant such a short notice meeting, Sir Nidai dully intoned with a critical eye at the principal. Indeed, Nezu chirped. It involves your investigation into Shai Hasekai. Sir Nidai was internally taken aback but he allowed nothing to break through his carefully maintained countenance. What about it? It has concluded, the chimera happily answered. For a fraction of a second, that stern expression broke. A brief glimmer of shock shined through the cracks before it was ruthlessly shoved down. I don't understand. Yeah, what do you mean, Mr. Principal? The confused Mirio Tagata inquired from beside his mentor. Kai Chisaki also known as Overhaul, died two nights ago, Nezu explained, maintaining his smile all the while. I figured you ought to be made aware of that before continuing a pursuit of a man who no longer walks this planet. Both humans were silent, Sir Naitai's stone-faced silence in contrast with his protege's wide-eyed gape. How did it happen, if I may ask? Mirio spoke up. Apparently, 
there was a conflict among rival criminal organizations that resulted in the destruction of an abandoned warehouse, Mezu began with an insincere shake of his head. I heard about that incident, Nighthai replied. It's suspected that the League of Villains was involved based on the manner in which the building was decayed to rubble. Well, overhaul was among that decay, Nezu cheerfully announced. How do you know? The former sidekick questioned curtly. I had a trusted associate investigate the incident. I suspected that the League of Villains was involved, and I wanted to be sure of any potential movement of the group before we instituted the dorm system. Who is this associate that so quickly gathered this evidence? Night I questioned further, his yellow eyes narrowing behind his rectangular lenses. You might be familiar with her, Nezu cryptically began. She used to go by Verdant. Naitai's eyes widened, his unreadable facade all but abandoned as a faint blush began to develop on his face. His third-year protege, meanwhile, lit up in excitement. Oh wow, really? Verdant's so cool. She's wicked smart and a great fighter to boot. It's honestly kind of weird how someone that small can pack such a punch. Then again, she seems a lot taller than she actually is during a fight. Mirio paused in his excitement when he noticed his mentor's state. Ah, uh, sir, are you okay? Yes, yes, I'm fine, Naitai quickly responded, forcefully regaining his composure. I see, then. Give Verdant my thanks and regards. I appreciate you for sharing this information with me. If you excuse me, I must return to my agency. Without another word, Naitai hastily stood, bowed, and left the office, Mirio confusedly hurrying along behind him after a quick wave goodbye to Nezu. Nezu's smile remained unchanged as he saw them off, but internally, the Chimera was cackling. Using Futurevision 420's propensity to be horny on main against him so that he wouldn't ask any further questions was genius if he did say so himself. Inkai, I'm glad you're here. Mitsuki greeted with a smile as she opened the door for Inko and Aizawa. Katsuki's being a little shit again, and you were really great with putting the fear of God into him the last time. Bite me, Hag, I don't need protection, her son shouted from the living room. It's for your own good, ya brat, she shouted back before turning back to the two teachers to beckon them inside. I figured you'd come by at some point, so I already made tea. Once the five were situated in the living room with the offered tea, Aizawa started off with his only slightly rehearsed speech about Yua prioritizing the safety of its students, especially those going down the dangerous path of heroics. However, it became clear fairly soon that their decision had already been made, regardless of his students' protests of being able to take care of himself. Take him, it'll be good for him, Mitsuki insisted with a smile. I should have sent him to live up there sooner, in all honesty. Why so? Inko asked. You know how teachers and other kids were during his early years, Mitsuki reminded, and Inko grimly nodded. A lot of things come easy to him, even outside of his quirk, so everybody being up his ass like he discovered diamonds up there helped him develop a big head. I was honestly afraid that his head would swell so big that people would start treating him like the plague for just being who he is. Her son steamed at being talked about so frankly while he was present, but he wouldn't dare interrupt. I'm really glad you're around to keep this knucklehead in line, she continued. People only know how to praise him superficially, but you know him well enough to be able to reach him and keep him grounded. It helps that I had you to deal with at his age, Inko playfully sniped. A vein protruded on Mitsuki's forehead as her son laughed in the background. If memory serves, I wasn't the one who nearly got expelled the first day of high school for knocking a girl's tooth out at lunch. Inko huffed and crossed her arms. Stuck up bitch had it coming for calling you Slimer. How exactly did you get away with that? Masaru asked while both his wife and his son were busy laughing. Crimson Riot was my homeroom teacher, and he threw me a bone. His exact words to the principal were, she's a little confused, but she's got the spirit. The ash blonde teen's laughter was twofold. The first reason was, of course, it was fucking hilarious. 
The second reason, though, was to ignore how nervous the green-haired woman made him feel at times. He had already learned his lesson well years prior, and then he learned it again at the start of Yua, but it bared repeating. Auntie Inko was fucking terrifying. Aizawa, meanwhile, was simply glad that Izuku turned out to be marginally less inclined to violence than his mother. Perhaps the green head would be a better influence on kids than he was, and the scraggly man could retire early by handing his job off to him after he graduated. That guy's name is Hans Gruber, Izuku pointed at the bearded man on screen before shoveling a handful of popcorn into his mouth. He's a bit of a weenie. Hans Gruber? Eri tentatively sounded out with a plate of apple slices in her lap. Izuku nodded. He's a bad man with a gang of cronies that just like to steal money and hurt innocent people. Real villain stuff. So, he's like overhaul, then Eri lowly spoke. Izuku didn't respond verbally to that, gazing worriedly down at the girl that had All Might's signature tufts of hair sticking out above her long mane of white. He was considering shutting the movie off and putting on something else in case she was flooded with bad memories, but he paused when he noticed her eyes narrowing at the screen. I want to see him disappear, the little girl declared in a vindictive tone that had traces of righteous determination. Izuku didn't know if he should have felt proud or concerned in that moment. Who's next after this? Inko asked as the two approached the massive mansion of the Yayurazu family later that day. Ashido and Kirishima, Aizawa replied. They live decently close to each other, though, so we could split up and get them done at once to save time. Sounds good, Inko said with a nod, but something caught her eye as they were nearing the front door. Or, rather, someone. Tadaroki, Aizawa asked in confusion, having noticed his presence at the same time as Inko and earning the attention of the heterochromatic teenager. Oh, Miss... Midoriya, Mr. K Aizawa, he addressed in his typical monotone, blinking in surprise at the encounter. What are you two doing here? Canvassing the homes of your class about the implementation of the dorms, Aizawa carefully drawled. Why are you here? I needed to get out of the house, he answered. Fair enough, the man conceded with a sigh. He really needed to get that boy into Hound Dog's office at the start of the school year but he supposed that it was better late than never. How's everyone doing? Inko asked with a soft, concerned tone. Fayumi is with mom, and the shouting matches between Natsuo and my dad become a bit tiresome, Todoroki responded. How are you doing? Inko followed up. The boy didn't respond right away. He stared at the concerned mother that so strongly resembled his best friend and couldn't help but see the other green heads form ghosting over her, offering him a concerned look as well. Then, he turned his head and looked back at the mansion, and his eyes trailed to a specific section of the house and settled on a particular window. After a brief moment of lingering silence, he turned back to face the woman. I think I'll be okay, the teen said with a nod, and both adults could hear the sincerity in his voice. With that, he continued on his way back down the path leading to the gate of the property. Why was he here of all places? Inko wondered aloud. It's best not to ask questions in situations like these, Aizawa suggested. Well, you'll be the one supervising them in the dorms, so I think you ought to be aware, Inko joked. Let's just get this over with, Aizawa groaned as he rang the doorbell, and the Cambridge chimes could be heard from where they were standing. Mere seconds later, the ornate door was opened, revealing a dapper butler. Ah, the teachers of Yua, the man spoke, welcoming them inside. The Yayurazu family was expecting you. I shall let them know that you've arrived. As the man walked away, the two teachers took in the sheer size and splendor of the foyer they had entered. Both parties felt completely out of their element in the luxurious abode occasionally peppered with maids and other employees quietly passing through, offering polite nods along the way. I am already uncomfortable, Inko whispered to Aizawa. Same here, he whispered back. The Yayurazu family shall see you now, the butler that welcomed them in informed them upon his return before motioning down the hall he had come from. Right this way. 
silently following the man. The two teachers were eventually led to another luxurious room with a fireplace and several parlor chairs surrounding it, three of which were already occupied by the Yayurazu family. The two teachers were greeted warmly by the fabulously wealthy family, and after being offered an absurdly large selection of tea and snacks, they were able to get down to business. So, Yua wishes to house their students personally, Sen Yayurazu began to the left of his daughter. I can certainly understand the rationale with everything that has transpired over the course of the semester, and allow me to say that I'm glad that your son is safe and back home with you, Mrs. Midoriya. Thank you, Inko nodded with a smile, not having the energy to correct him about no longer being married. With that said, Hayaku Yeirazu spoke up to the right of her daughter, and both Inko and Aizawa noticed how the teenager's eyes lost a bit of their brightness when she heard her mother's voice. While our daughter thankfully wasn't badly injured, it concerns me that you're moving on so suddenly and implementing a dorm system as if nothing ever occurred once the situation was resolved. Inko sent a quick glance to Momo, particularly the way she was beginning to clasp her hands together. The girl was tense. Inko didn't like where this was headed. Beside her, Aizawa chose to address Hayaku's concerns. We agree with everything you've said. It is true that we have become complacent, and it is time that we took action to better protect our young heroes in training. The safety of her and all other UA students is our number one priority. Aizawa bowed his head before the family, shocking his student. Adjacently, we solemnly swear that we will train her to the best of our ability to become an excellent hero. Your daughter is brimming with potential to do fantastic things, and we want to nurture that and allow it to blossom. Will you be willing to entrust the safety of your daughter in U.S. care once again? The reactions from the family were incredibly varied. Momo was swimming in a mixture of shock, pride, and hope. Sen's smile of approval told Aizawa that what he said was exactly what the man wanted to hear, and it boded well for the future of his student. No. Four heads snapped in the direction of the stern-faced Hayaku Yayurazu. Excuse me? The daughter of the family managed to sound out, the dread present in her tone indicating that she was afraid of this exact outcome. Your father doesn't want to say it because it will hurt you but it's time to move on, Momo, Hayaku bluntly stated. Your heroics fancies were cute when you were younger, but you're nearly an adult now. It's time to grow up, be realistic with yourself, and make use of your actual talents. Momo was the picture of crestfallen at the brutal declaration, and one frantic look towards her father for any sort of lifeline only faced her with a look of sad resignation from the man. Tears welled up in her eyes as she hung her head. Inko silently observed the deteriorating interaction with a piercing gaze. Aizawa made to speak, but Inko put a hand on his wrist and motioned for him to let her handle it. Mr. Yayurazu, could you give us a minute? Inko calmly asked the man. Sen blinked, completely taken aback by the request, but not having an issue doing so. Oh, um, certainly. As he stood up and left the room, Inko turned to her co-worker. Aizawa, why don't you go with Mr. Yayorazu into the other room and tell him about your cats? Aizawa stared blankly at her. What? Inko's green eyes filled with unholy darkness as she stabbed through the scraggly man's very being with her glare. Tell him about your cats. Right, let's go talk about my cats. Aizawa quickly acquiesced without another moment wasted, leaving the woman to it. Momo thought she was reading the situation correctly, so she stood up and excused herself as well, but Inko stopped her. Stay, Momo. Uh, are you sure? Momo hesitated. Positive, she answered with a kind smile, then that smile vanished when she turned to Hayaku. What exactly did you mean by actual talents? My daughter is brilliant. Hayaku began, pleased to gush over her daughter's intellectual acumen. She has enjoyed reading encyclopedias for pleasure since she was four, and she has memorized just about every chemistry dictionary there is. The Yayurazu Company is the largest developer of pharmaceuticals and medical instruments in Japan. 
She is a literal goldmine for that field, even discounting her powerful quirk. She could be doing so many other fantastic things if she wasn't wasting her energy on heroics. The mother paused. No offense. None taken, Inko replied in a completely unreadable tone. I merely want the best for her, Hayaku sighed. If she stopped dividing her time and energy amongst things that don't matter, she can finally become perfect at the things that do. She's an heiress, and she's being primed to take the reins of the Yayurazu company when the time comes. She needs to focus on what matters rather than passing fancies. Who says heroics is just a passing fancy for her, Inko challenged. Isn't it for everyone? Provided they don't die in their twenties or thirties, I mean, Hayaku responded. That's, Inko sighed and closed her eyes. That's not technically incorrect, I suppose, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Inko opened her eyes and set her sights on the girl in question. Momo, why do you want to be a hero? Momo flinched and she shrank under the newfound attention. You have nothing to worry about, Inko kindly assured. Just be completely honest, you're allowed to speak your mind here. Momo looked at Inko with hope flickering in her eyes once more, and then she took a hesitant glance toward her mother. After a brief moment to collect herself and her thoughts, she cleared her throat. I have everything, she began, mustering up the confidence to continue speaking. I've never wanted for anything. I know that isn't the case for everyone, and it can't ever feasibly be so. Even still, if I'm in a position to help someone in need, Regardless of what it is, I want to do it. Be it financially, emotionally, spiritually, or physically by protecting and defending them with my life. I have a lot of power, both figuratively and literally. What good would I be if I just let it go to waste when I could be out there making lives better with it? She turned to her mother. I know you've always wanted me to be perfect, and I know I've always been a disappointment to you in that regard but I don't need to be perfect in order to help people. I just need to do everything in my power, and I'll always do that, no matter the situation. Even if it's not perfect, when lives are in danger, they'll never get less than my best. That's my promise to you, to Father, to Miss, Midoriya, to Mr. Aizawa, to the entirety of Japan, and to myself. Hayaku was speechless. She had no idea that her daughter's desire to be a hero went that deep, and it made her feel a bit of shame for never truly inquiring why she wanted to go that route in the first place. Alongside that, her daughter felt as though she thought she was a failure. Is that, is that how you really feel? She quietly asked. Momo nodded, and she struggled to maintain eye contact with her mother. It didn't go unnoticed. You're not a disappointment, Momo. And I'm sorry if I ever made you feel that way, she apologized, her tone still muted. Inko was trying to figure that little quirk out to determine if the woman was actually being sincere, but she couldn't quite parse it. She supposed it didn't really matter, either way. The goal was to get their permission for Momo to live in the dorms, and doing so would get the girl away from her mother regardless. I, Hayaku trailed off, then she sighed and looked her daughter in the eye. If this is truly what you want and what you feel you need. It is, she resolutely nodded. Fine, the mother conceded, and Momo's face lit up. I will support you. A choked sob escaped the young girl, and she quickly excused herself from the room. Inko sighed in relief and a bit of exhaustion. The day had already been long, and this visit had only made it even longer. I'm placing my trust in you. Inko heard the woman say to her, and her attention refocused upon the stern-faced mother. I'll vest a personal interest in progressing her training myself if I must, Inko assured the woman. You'd best, she accepted with a nod. Her ideas of the profession hadn't completely changed, but she was given a lot to think about. The bald doctor skittered about his lab like a neurotic roach. His coat was barely hanging on and dragging against the floor, his facial hair was a scraggly mess, and not even his goggles could hide the insanity in his eyes. That filthy traitor, Garaki growled, the image of Tamura in his mind warping into a lifelike hallucination of the man dusting his benefactor with a manic grin plastered on his face, 
staring right at the doctor with a wild gleam in his blood-red gaze. You're next? No, I am not. And all for one is not dead. He slammed his fist into the nearest table, sending empty trays and discarded equipment clattering to the floor. You are alive. Garaki placed a hand on a large tank that was situated away from tanks of high-end and near-high-end gnomus. And I will bring you back to greatness. The man's insane gaze looked blissfully upon the tank. Floating in purple liquid with a respirator on his face and his body stuck with a forest of tubes was an almost brain-dead Yuga Aoyama. Plan B will prevail. This is the last one, right? Inko asked Aizawa as they approached their final destination. You don't have any illegitimate students floating around that we don't know about, right? God, I hope not, Aizawa replied. I have enough problem children to expel as it is. The two continued their approach to the large house situated a decent distance away from the nearest neighbors. Both Inko and Aizawa internally remarked that it was a great situation to live in given the amount of privacy it afforded. The French flag that flew on a small flagpole billowed in the evening breeze as the sun set over the long, tiring day, creating an explosion of orange and pink hues in the sky. The duo of teachers reached the front doorstep and they rang the doorbell. They waited for a response, but none came. That wasn't anything abnormal. It was a big house, and it could reasonably take some time for someone to reach the front door from the other side of the house. That also assumed that they were home to begin with, but there were several cars present on the property, so both teachers assumed that at least one person was home. They continued waiting. And waiting. And waiting. Who are we waiting on, again? Inko asked Aizawa, growing mildly irritated at the wait time. The Aoyama family, Aizawa answered, not too dissimilar in his state of annoyance. Someone has to be home. Have you looked through the window? Inko asked. Curtains are drawn, Aizawa lamented. Is it locked? I'd rather you not break into my student's home. Party pooper, Inko joked with an exaggerated pout and she absent-mindedly surveyed the rest of the property from her vantage point until she spotted an odd patch of grass on the side of the house. Walking over closer to get a better look, she noticed that there was broken glass in the spot. Hold on a sec, she said to Aizawa before stepping over to investigate. Reaching the glass, she bent down and surveyed it, and much of the glass was stained with dried blood. Looking out at the rest of the grass surrounding it, even more shards of glass were scattered about, some stained with blood and some not. Aizawa, she called over to the younger underground pro. What is it? he called back, coming over investigate the issue. Inko looked up at the side of the house and spotted one of the windows was completely destroyed. Then, she looked back at the approaching man. We're breaking in. I'll make. Inko trudged up the stairs of her apartment complex and fished for her keys. Canvassing every student in 1A and convincing their parents to trust in Yua enough to let them house their children was a task in and of itself, never mind the fact that some parents were doubly resistant after their child had foolishly gone vigilante to rescue her son and put themselves in harm's way. She truly loved her son more than anything in the world, but sometimes that boy was exhausting. Seriously, inspiring so much trust and camaraderie in his classmates to the point where they'd literally and unashamedly break the law to rescue him from trouble. What happened to the days of simply flying under the radar? She couldn't fight the snorts any further and lost her composure, laughing at the ridiculous thoughts of her son being at fault for being likable. If she was being honest, the world needed more people like her son and less people like herself. On that depressing thought, she reached her front door and unlocked it, opening it right as Izuku turned the corner in a strut with Iri sitting on his shoulders. Body once told me the world was gonna roll me, I ain't the sharpest tool in the she. Izuku trailed off when he saw his mother standing at the doorway and giving him an impossibly blank stare. The apartment was silent as the two stared at each other, Izuku's embarrassed blush growing by the second. Welcome home, Mom, Izuku awkwardly managed, only making the situation worse on his end by speaking. 
meanwhile, on Izuku's shoulders with her tiny hands holding fistfuls of his wild, curly hair, Eri had no such concepts of shame and awkward silences. Yippee kai ye, mother fu. Eri, Izuku hurriedly shushed the girl, but the damage was already done, and Izuku met his mother's hard glare. I can explain. Inko remained silent, allowing for Izuku to explain, as promised. No explanations came however, and Izuku merely floundered under his mom's glare and Iri's playful tugs of his hair. When his mother's eyes narrowed, Izuku knew that she was going to let him have it for corrupting the precious youth mere days after finding her. I can't believe you two watched Die Hard without me, Inko indignantly accused. Five seconds of silence passed before Inko burst into laughter once again, and Izuku, realizing his mother had been screwing with him, fell bonelessly to the floor in a frustrated huff with Eri safely planted on his back. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through What If Deku Unleashed God-like Quirk That Surpassed All? I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Drip Bayless for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to What If Deku 2 for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.